quase que falo assim, não preciso estar aqui, né? Porque nós viemos é, escutar é, o Ocampo. É, mas me pediram que eu apresentasse. É, eu, é, a apresentação, assim, dois minutos. Eu e pensando assim, o que dizer do campo? Ah, é, o campo foi ministro na Colômbia, agricultura, economia, secretário é, executivo da CEPAL, secretário adjunto é, do Departamento é, Econômico e Social das Nações Unidas e hoje professor de Colômbia. É, mais o que, o mais importante é que você, Antônio, é meu amigo. Isso é o mais importante. E ele é meu amigo, apesar de que, apesar dos meus repetidos convites, ele nunca foi a Minas Gerais. Isso, é, pois é, é para ele ficar com um sentimento de culpa mesmo. Mas é, o que eu queria dizer sobre o campo sério é o seguinte. Eu, é, é, o, o Schumpeter, num dos últimos escritos dele, ele dizia que... É, é, o, o economista, ele se esconde atrás, a, atrás de um aparato técnico, mas por detrás do aparato técnico sempre tem uma visão de mundo, uma visão política, que muitas vezes ela fica é, assim meio, é, meio sumida por detrás de uma visão de mundo quase que normativa. É, e há algum tempo atrás eu estava é, pensando sobre esse assunto de desenvolvimento e eu, eu, me surgiu o conceito de desenvolvimento engajado, no sentido que é, nós tratamos, eu não sei se a gente compartimentaliza muito o assunto de desenvolvimento ou a gente o torna muito holístico e aí a gente fala de tudo e aí as conexões são todas muito difíceis de serem feitas. É, e o desenvolvimento engajado, ele vinha quase que como uma resposta a esse ponto do Schumpeter, é que nós temos, que quando tratarmos do assunto de desenvolvimento, nós temos que assumir de modo explícito a dimensão política é, a política no sentido partidário, é, a político é, 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 do desenvolvimento. E alguma coisa que talvez que não está na ficha resumo é, de Ocampo, é que Ocampo é, ele tem afiliações partidárias explícitas. Então, ele é um economista, não é? além de ser um economista político, ele é um economista e um político. Então, com vocês... Muito obrigado, Dr. Carlos. <risos> ah, e, 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 muito, muitas graças ao, ao Centro Celso Furtado por a invitação para estar neste segundo congresso. E muitas graças ao senador Saturnino, a, a Rosa, e, por, la, por esta invitação. E, e, bueno, e, me han pedido que hable em inglês, o qual contribui muito a minha esquizofrenia mental porque la presentación está en castellano, <risa> pero bueno, es para beneficio de, los, de la traducción y especialmente mi amigo Deepak Nayar. Entonces eh, voy a pasar entonces a, al inglés. Eh, eh, what I want to, to, um, eh, to discuss today, um, if, eh, let me say that it was a challenge for me to, to prepare this uh, Uh, because I, you know, I generally talk economics. Uh, I do uh, a bit of politics, and and I have participated in uh, in several political reflections in Latin America. And I will start actually with one of them, which uh, it was the uh, the uh, the two uh, 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 consultation processes or projects that uh, the United Nations Development Program did on democracy in Latin America. Uh, I actually co-directed uh, the second one which was done together with the Organization of American States. But, you know, so I, I want to link, uh, uh, you know, those reflections on politics and uh, with some reflections on, uh, on economic and social development. And as uh, you will see, my, my major uh, statement uh, is that we have done much more progress in democracy and and social development, which I think is a democratic dividend for Latin America, uh, than we have been able to do in economic development. So there is a mismatch uh, between uh, what we have succeeded in the, particularly in the social field, and what we have done in the uh, economic field. 
uh, and, uh, and I think that is the tension. So, so I think the you know Rosa was uh, discussing in the beginning where the, the the conference should be called the uh, you know a, a new democracy for a new development or a new development for a new democracy. And I think the the, the particular order is the correct one. I think it's an, a, a new development for a new democracy because I think that we have been much more successful in democracy than in development. So, so I will start by by the. In, in these two projects of UNDP, uh, the second one with OIS, uh, they, you know, after lots of consultations, uh, the, um, uh, they came to, to the conclusion that there are three uh, essential uh, elements uh, of democracy. The first one are free uh, and transparent elections. Uh, the second is the expansion of, of citizenship uh, in its three uh, dimensions, uh, civil, political, and social. Uh, and the third is the consolidation of uh, uh, what this, the second report uh, called Republican Institutions, uh, which is the, uh, the division of power, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the, a modern civil service, uh, and uh, uh, accountability. So let me say that, uh, and I will, you know, reflect on this. But the, the second one uh, is the one that uh, connects directly with the, um, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, with economics and, and social policy, uh, because at the end, you know, uh, th this principle, which is very well in, in embedded in uh, some of the modern constitutions of Latin America, let's say, but notably the 1988 uh, uh, Brazilian Constitution, or the 1991 Colombian Constitution, uh, which puts at the center of the whole constitutional regime the concept of rights. Rights of citizens, including the civil, the political, and the social and economic rights. So, so I, I will uh, that. But there are also other complications. Uh, and, and let me say that uh, I, I will reflect up, upon some of them. Some are old, some are more recent. Uh, that uh, relate to these tensions uh, that we will uh, be building. So the, the, the first and, and I think a, a more, you know, most important tension uh, is the, the tension between representative democracy and participatory democracy. Uh, the, the, mes the, uh, the most uh, important reflection of this uh, is that the, is the, the, the crisis of political parties <coughs> Which is a widespread issue in uh, all of Latin America, but it's a, also, a, a, you know, a major issue worldwide, uh, even in, in developed countries, uh, and the explosion of civil society. Civil society movements are exploding everywhere, and the young people, to be sincere, want to be civil society. They don't want to be, uh, you know, participants in the in the political parties. I think that is a is a big tension. When in my generation. Uh, the persons who were politically motivated uh, wanted to join government. Today they want to join NGOs. And I think that, that is a, 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 the a very concrete manifestation uh, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, crisis. So, the, uh, so on, the, on the one hand, uh, this is a very welcome feature. I think at the end, uh, you know, a dense, what I call a dense civil society uh, has to be the, the essence of a good democracy. Uh, uh, but in the, in the short term, uh, this has generated a, a lot of tensions because the political system uh, seems quite incapable of absorbing the forces uh, generated by civil society. Uh, so the, uh, in, you can say the, uh, in, and, and there is also a, in, a, an important tension uh, in, in, you know, in, 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 you know, in, in regards to the fact uh, that uh, that. Uh, a representative democracy it has a, a very well-known, established way of, of determining who is who represents whom. Uh, this is not true of civil society. For example, when you have, you know, for example, in my country, uh, we experience uh, in the last two years massive movements uh, of, uh, of rural so uh, civil society. You know, lots of mobilizations, lots of strikes uh, in rural areas. Uh, you know, but one major issue is who represents whom. You know, how representative those actors are. 
This is an issue that has been solved, you know, in the in, the, in representative democracy. It's not quite uh, solved in uh, in participatory democracy. Perhaps with the old, uh, with the exception uh, of the old system, which is uh, uh, labor unions, where there is a very well established way of uh, knowing who is uh, how representatives uh, are the different movements and what is the structure of power uh, in those organizations. So the, this tension uh, has to be solved. Uh, not by replacing civil society, which is a, you know, is a temptation uh, of some you know, governments, uh, but rather by you know, continuing to promote uh, open civil society, uh, a, a very dense civil society, at the same time uh, that, uh, um, uh, that you uh, try to adopt the agenda that is uh, spread by civil society uh, in the best way through the representative political system. And of course, the, the best, uh, the, the worst case is when the, uh, the crisis of, of the political systems, uh, you know, leads to, uh, to uh, let's say, per personalism in politics, uh, which is a, a very old Latin American temptation. Okay, and I think that's the worst form of all. Um, now, this tension, I think, is behind uh, many of the things that, are, that we see about the tension between social progress and economic uh, issues. Uh, because at the end, uh, what we will see is that you know uh, we will see in many movements, you know, including those of Brazil, in the last uh, couple of years, or the, co the ones in Colombia, in the, in the last couple of years, that you know somehow the economic system doesn't respond uh, to the uh, demands of you know of some emerging sectors uh, in uh, in society. Uh, for example, uh, and very particularly, it doesn't respond to the aspirations of a young a more trained uh, a, a, a society, which is, as, as we will see, is a major, major issue uh, that we see in Latin America. There are some older issues uh, on and newer ones uh, that I will just, uh, other tensions in democracy. Uh, the one which, for example, is very important in, in uh, and I'm, I'm, since I'm working on, on the Commission on Rural Development in Colombia, is a very central issue in, in the debate, uh, which is the democratic control over local powers. Uh, which is generally, uh, you know, much weaker than democratic control over national powers. Uh, so the, that, that is, a, is a major issue, uh, and the temptation uh, of many people is to solve this uh, tension by, uh, you know, uh, centralism. You know, so the central national government tries to intervene into local governments. I think that's that's not the way to go. I think that the way to go is actually to to promote civil society at the local level, and you know, and let civil society control local government. I think that at the end that's a much better. So it goes along my view that you know the, the spread, uh, the spread of civil society is one of the good you know news uh, on democracy in Latin America. The second, the second tension, which is very much so, uh, a tension generated by the you know the market reform agenda in Latin America, is this tension between what technocracy and democracy, uh, the aspiration of technocratic groups uh, to control government. Uh, and uh, you know, under the premise uh, of orthodox, you know, of many orthodox thinkers, uh, that technocracy uh, is much, you know, a technocratic government is much better than a democratic government. I think that tension is false. I think there is no such a thing. I think there is no strong evidence. And I think market reforms are one case in which, you know, a, a, an agenda that was spread very strongly by technocracy uh, happened to have, you know, relatively poor results uh, in in, uh, in Latin America. And finally, uh, the uh, you know a related uh, tension uh, is the uh, the idea that you know then we should uh, try to, you know there are too many government failures, uh, so we should allow the private sector to take over uh, in the provision of uh, of uh, public sector goods. Uh, and I would say you know there are many many uh, cases uh, of failure of that idea in Latin America. I mean some of them are really major political events like Bolivia. For example, in which the, uh, the you know it was actually, in a sense, it started as a revolution against public-private partnerships in water, uh, and ended up in a major political change, uh, and uh, that's one particular case. But there are many, many others. I think there is a, a, again a very mixed story uh, of this, and there is no substitute, absolutely no substitute, to building a stronger uh, state capacities. The state capacities at the national level and state capacities at the local level. I think there is no substitute for that.
But the major issue that I want to address is the, this issue of the, uh, the tension between the social and economic advance in Latin America. Um, so the, the major issue here uh, of democracy is the spread of citizenship and, of, and then of, therefore of economic and social rights. Uh, and the rights of citizens uh, is, uh, has to be the essence of the link between democracy and economic and social development. And in that regard, uh, uh, the democratic wave that we have seen in Latin America, uh, which started with uh, Ecuador in 1979, and then it spread to many other countries uh, in the 1980s until the, the uh, transition in Chile uh, uh, in the late 1980s. Uh, you know, that big uh, you know, jump in democracy, which has turned to be stable. I mean, uh, Oglobo uh, asked me about the, you know, the failure uh, of the Arab Spring. I said, I don't know about the failure of Arab Spring too much. Uh, what I know is about the, the success of democracy in Latin America. That democratic wave is with us today. So it's 35 years uh, of a democratic wave which has been stable in Latin America. And I think that is uh, a major, major in event. This is by far the, the, uh, the, the region of the developing world that is most democratic today. And I think that we should see as a great success uh, in the history of Latin America. This period uh, is, uh, is partly associated, or, or I would say largely associated, to external events that were extremely favorable for Latin America. <coughs> but it's a uh, uh, but after those, uh, that conjunction of good uh, external events uh, you know, uh, broke down, uh, we are not. Uh, in the, in, you know, we have seen, again, a very slow economic growth. <coughs> so, the, um, uh, so we do need a new economy for a new democracy. I think uh, we, you know, democracy has uh, spread many, uh, many social, positive social events, uh, but uh, not uh, so uh, in the economic field. So let me go to the uh, <coughs> positive social trends. And in this regard, uh, there, there are two, uh, le let me focus first on the long-term trends, the positive long-term trends. The positive long-term trends uh, are associated uh, to the uh, increase in social spending that has happened in every Latin American country uh, in the last uh, 25 years. Uh, and it's a very strong upward trend. Uh, and the result of that is that uh, the advance in human development of Latin America is quite impressive. Uh, in fact, if we exclude uh, income, uh, in which we have not done much progress, and, in, and even we, you know, the distribution of income, uh, actually Latin America is now ahead of international trends uh, in human development. So this is the story of social spending, according to the uh, CEPAL data. You know, there was, a, a, as you saw in, the, in blue here, uh, you know, a downward trend in the 1980s during the debt crisis, uh, which was actually weaker than the reduction in overall public sector spending, well, which reflects the fact that there was a priority given to social spending even during the crisis. But then, you know, starting in the early 1990s, the red line shows the very strong upward trend in social spending, which uh, on average uh, has increased social spending by, by six percentage points of GDP. And the result of that, uh, and this has been a, a very widespread uh, trend, this is country by country, the, uh, I mean there are also, of course today significant differences in the level of spending uh, of, you know, as a proportion of GDP of uh, different Latin American countries. Uh, you know, for example, uh, you see Argentina, Brazil, uh, Costa Rica, and Uruguay uh, you know, are well ahead of the rest. But every single country has, a spin, has a, a increased social spending, which is the, the uh, you know, the, the light bars here uh, are the uh, social spending in the early 90s. Uh, the blue, the dark blue, is the increase in social spending that has taken place uh, since the early 1990s. And the result of this is advance in human development. So the, uh, here I compare the uh, advances since 1990 uh, in all countries, and very interestingly, I, I disaggregate uh, education and health in dark uh, from the total human development. And actually, for most countries of Latin America, there are a few exceptions. Uh, the advance in human development just measured by education and health is much stronger than the advance in, in the overall index of human development. 
What is most striking when I take the 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 the, the, the most recent figures, uh, 2012, and I compare to the international pattern, which is the line in this graph, uh, and, and and I do this for the this is the non-income human development uh, uh, index adjusted for inequality. Okay, adjusted for inequality, and you see that most Latin American countries are now on top of the international trend. That at least we have a social, we have education, and and health levels, uh, which are on top of the international trend, and those and the access to those has become much more equal, uh, thanks to reforms in the social area uh, than they used to be. So there are a few exceptions. Uh, uh, actually, uh, most exceptions are uh, near the line, like Mexico, Brazil, and, and Guatemala. Uh, there is only one country that's really far uh, below the line, which is the Dominican Republic. Every other single country is on top of the international uh, trend uh, in this regard. The second set of indicators ref uh, refer to, to labor markets, uh, to poverty, and income distribution. In that regard, uh, there are two, uh, is, uh, two very different periods. In 1990 to 2002, in which there is a worsening of many of those indicators. In labor markets, uh, as well as uh, income distribution, generally worsened during that period. But since 2003, it has been proven uh, so that Latin America has become one of the regions of the world, uh, a probably major region of the world, uh, where income distribution has actually improved in most countries in the last 10 years. In any case, you know, much more remains to be done. Um, this is the story of the, of the Latin American uh, indicators of, of the labor market, uh, the, uh, uh, the occupation uh, rate or the employment rate in blue, and the unemployment rate in red. So the proportion of people in working age who are employed uh, is the blue line. Uh, the unemployment is the pr that proportion of the labor force that doesn't have work. And you see the worsening through the 1990s and early 2000s. So the labor, uh, you know, employment fell as a, you know, relative to a, a working age population, and unemployment increased. But since, since 2002, 2003, we have seen the opposite, very strong trends, which were only moderately affected by the crisis, very moderately affected by the crisis. So that, you know, for example, what this shows is that there has been, you know, five percent of the working age population uh, has been uh, has been has, has got a job, a new job in the last uh, ten years. It's a huge increase in the in uh, in the labor market. Furthermore, when you try to disaggregate this by formality and informality, uh, you see that the, it's actually formal employment that has increased the fastest. So employment, the employment market has improved dramatically in the last ten years. And as a result, I think, uh, you know, you see the uh, huge reduction in poverty, uh, you know, 50 percent uh, uh, reduction in the, in the, in the, in the poverty uh, index uh, in Latin America. Uh, you can see that still in 2002, we were above the levels of poverty of 1980. Uh, but then we have 15, this is the largest fall of, of uh, poverty in history. Uh, in Latin America, the only comparable decade is actually the 1970s. Uh, but this is probably, uh, but the you know comparison is very difficult. But it's probably better than the 1970s. And um, uh, and this is the the World Bank indicator that shows that the, uh, the these are from Cepal, these are from the World Bank. They show more or less the same story. The red line, a huge reduction in poverty, and uh, as a result, the rise of the middle class in in blue. Uh, which now uh, is uh, higher, uh, or, uh, excuse me, larger uh, than the population in poverty. And one of the results, uh, one of the things that is behind this is the, is the break in inequality. So there are different ways of weighting different indexes of inequality. I will not go into the details, but you see the, uh, the, the tendency of the uh, Gini coefficient to increase. Uh, in the 1980s and uh, particularly the 1990s, uh, and in contrast to that, the reduction in inequality that has taken place uh, in the last 10 years. So, according to this, actually, the current levels of inequality in Latin America are better uh, than those of the 1980s, which is a significant change. Uh, and uh, furthermore, this is true of most countries. So, this is every country in Latin America. 
uh, comparing uh, the levels, the current levels, uh, the late, latest uh, indicator for 2011 uh, with the indicators of 1997 in, in, uh, in uh, uh, yellow or 2003 in blue. I see compared to 2003, you know, uh, uh, almost every country, the only exception is actually Costa Rica, uh, has improved. Uh, we compared to uh, 1997, there are three exceptions, Costa Rica, Honduras, and Uruguay. The rest of Latin America uh, it has experienced a huge reduction in equality. Uh, actually, the most important, uh, most important case in Latin America is Bolivia, uh, uh, where it has improved the, the strongest. Uh, and Bolivia turned from being a, a country with high levels uh, one of the highest levels of inequality in Latin America to having uh, a moderate level by Latin American standards. But the same thing is true of uh, many other countries in Latin America. So th there are many ways to interpret this, uh, this data. Um, what I would say is uh, th that the, um, uh, the conditional cash transfers, or, the, uh, or generally the, the uh, cash transfers, uh, have, uh, according to all the available uh, information, uh, uh, done uh, is bit, uh, but they don't explain more than, you know, at most 20% of improvement. Uh, the exception is actually Brazil, where, you know, the, you know, the transfers are much more widespread uh, than the conditional cash transfer, more than Bolsa Familia. Okay. So that the uh, uh, so there is much more broad based, uh, and the result of uh, so the most of the result is really has happened in the labor market, and I, I th in, in my view is the conjunction of two factors, uh, one that is the result of social policy as we will see, which is increased education levels of the labor force, okay, and the second uh, is actually uh, uh, the result of, of the demographic transition. Uh, the fact that the labor force grows at a much slower rate today uh, than it used to uh, in even 10 years ago. Uh, so the labor force grows much more slowly today, and, and this is a result of the demographic transition, and also because the, the participation level of women in the labor force, uh, which uh, was a major factor behind the rapid growth in the labor force, has, uh, has uh, tried to, has even out. Um, so that the, uh, the result of this is that the labor force Grows, grows much more slowly today uh, than it used to be, and that uh, labor force that go, gets into the labor market is much more educated. Uh, so, to put it simply, we have ceased to be a region with abundant, unskilled labor force. And I think that is uh, the transition that we are experiencing, and which I think is a permanent transition uh, due to the conjunction of good social policy with these uh, huge uh, you know, changes in the labor market. These are some of the numbers. This is the, the growth of the labor force in Latin America. Uh, you still see, this is the, since the 1950s. It, it peaked uh, in the 1970s, but you see, even in 1990, 1990, 1997, it was growing over 3% per year. Now, in most recent years, for example, 2008, 2012, it's, behind, it's below 2%. So it's one percentage point uh, less growth in the labor force, and it, of course, it's predicted uh, to continue falling, uh, but if equally important, this is what happened with the education level of the labor force. In a matter of 20 years, we went to have, you know, we went to having uh, less than 10 percent of the uh, labor force with 13 years of education less, to more than uh, to uh, to about 20 percent. So we had doubled in in 20 years the proportion of the labor force uh, with the 13 years of education or more. What is most interesting, most of the change has happened uh, since 2002, so in the last 10 years. And, and this is, of course, something that you had to uh, invest before. Uh, because in, uh, so it, it's the result of an effort that started in 1990. But the, the, the last, you do not the average uh, uh, labor force uh, with that level of education, but the marginal change. So the additional labor force. Uh, between 2002 and 2010, you'll find out that half of the new labor force has 13 years of education. It's a huge historical change. So we, we do have a much more uh, educated labor force than we have ever had. And I think this is a huge change, uh, which I think is a permanent uh, change. So the conjunction of this and this is, I think, a new uh, f in a reality for Latin America. It's a long-term effect. 
and you know, again, you know, largely the result of very active social policy. Therefore, of course, many things that, 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 that still have to be done. Inequality continues to be high uh, in most Latin American countries. Uh, you know, you know, there are of course differences. Uh, uh, and, and furthermore, you, you try to uh, you, you estimate that, uh, not this methodology of the Gini coefficient, uh, but actually the one percent. Uh, okay. Uh, the one percent, uh, you'll find out uh, that the you know the inequality is. I mean, the two countries for which there have been recent estimates of the share of the one percent uh, in income, which is Colombia and Chile, uh, the data shows that according to the methodology between twenty and thirty percent, twenty percent and thirty percent, you include uh, capital gains. It's a huge. Uh, it's it's much more much more unequal than any other estimates of the kind. Second, uh, the uh, increase in social security continues to be low. Um, uh, and this is particularly uh, uh, for the uh, informal labor force uh, in red here. Uh, and it depends also on the, the nature of the labor contract. I will not deal. I mean, the labor contract is still is the major uh, uh, entry to the social security system, which generates some unfairness. Uh, and, uh, and finally, and, and very importantly, what we distribute through the fiscal system uh, is still relatively low. So this is the comparison uh, of Latin America with uh, OECD. Uh, uh, OECD excluding the two Latin American countries uh, that are members, uh, that is uh, Mexico and Chile. Uh, and what you see is that, that the Gini coefficient is better in OECD before uh, social, uh, fiscal redistribution, but the huge change, which are the blue bars, is because of the much larger fiscal redistribution that takes place in OECD relative to what takes place in Latin America. <laughs> now, in contrast to that, we have what I call frustrating economic trends. So, the the, uh, the uh, so I will start by saying the uh, uh, growth, economic growth in Latin America, has been frustrating since market reforms. <laughs> the, so, this promise the, that we will salt uh, 25 years ago, or so. That just liberalize the economies and we'll be happy, and we'll have a very dynamic uh, process of economic growth that has not materialized. And uh, within that trend, the only exception is actually the period 2003-2007. So, as I say in many of my lectures, uh, there is this talk about the decade of Latin America. I would say, in social terms, there was there is a decade of Latin America. In economic terms, we have a quinquennium. Okay. But because the, the results in, uh, since the crisis, uh, this uh, North Atlantic financial crisis, uh, has been ra uh, rather poor. So what happened is that in 2003, 2007, there are many positive things in economic policy. I'll mention some. Uh, but the, uh, it was the conjunction of four positive factors for Latin America. First of all, the commodity boom. Second, the very rapid growth of international trade. Okay. Third. The access to finance, for example, I, I, I've been estimated by the mid-2000s, mid uh, we went back to the cost of financing that Latin America had in the late 1970s. So we had had you know, higher financing costs for 25 years. Uh, that was overcome. Uh, and finally, we had, uh, very importantly for the northern part of the region, we have lots of migration opportunities to the U.S. and Spain, in particular. Uh, that was a you know a way out for many of the uh, uh, you know Latin American citizens. Now, with the crisis, uh, uh, what happened is that we lost two of these factors, as we will see. We lost migration opportunities. Uh, I think forever. Of, I mean, for the foreseeable future, let's say. Uh, and we also lost, and this is not well recognized, dynamic international trade. So we have two uh, that remain, uh, which are uh, access to finance uh, and uh, high commodity prices. But in my view, uh, high commodity prices uh, has, uh, uh, has ceased to be uh, the huge opportunity it used to be. So the result of this is that growth has fallen uh, significantly. Uh, uh, so this is the, uh, the graph of Latin American growth since 1950. Uh, the red uh, bars uh, show the, that the, the period 2003-2007 uh, was the best since the 1967-1974. So it was exceptional. 
but within a, a pattern that is actually of low, slow economic growth. So what has, has happened since the crisis is that we went back to a, a, a growth level of about 2.9 percent per year, uh, except for the you know a, you know the phenomenal year 2010, in which we had a very strong recovery. And this is uh, shown here. I mean, we, we have economic growth, uh, which is uh, has been since 1990 about is about 3.3 percent per year, compared to five and a half percent, which we used to grow. Uh, in uh, between 1950 and 1980. And the second is, is much more volatile uh, than it used to be. Basically, the coefficient of variation, which is the last column, which shows that it's doubled in terms of volatility than it used to be. This is actually, you can see in the graph that you know the growth has been extremely volatile uh, in the last 25 years compared to the historical pattern. Now, there, within that, there are some strengths, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and some uh, uh, weaknesses. Uh, so let, let me say, let me go just through the graphs. The strength, uh, we are much less indebted abroad than it used, we used to be. This is the, the uh, debt to GDP ratio, uh, and in the bottom, the red, the net debt to the GDP, uh, GDP ratio, which I net out uh, the accumulation of foreign exchange reserves. So uh, we are essentially not, in ter not indebted abroad uh, in net terms, uh, and this has given a huge uh, a, a room of maneuver for monetary policy. I think the big improvement in monetary policy in Latin America is not independence of central banks. It's the fact that we are not indebted abroad. And I think that that, that is what gave the, uh, room, you know, the freedom uh, to do countercyclical monetary policies uh, during the recent crisis and the room that we still have to do that uh, now. Uh, the second big improvement is, uh, is investment. So the investment rate uh, has increased as, uh, consistently over the last 10 years. Uh, it, it still, on average, is below the boom of the uh, second half of the 1970s. Uh, that, uh, you know, there are huge differences across countries, but there is a, a rising of, uh, uh, investment, which was not true in the 1990s. Uh, so, the, the, so there is a confidence, let's say, of uh, the business class. There are, all, of course, exceptions uh, to this rule. Uh, uh, again, I will not get into them, uh, but I will mention just one, uh, which is infrastructure. Uh, so, the, uh, you know, very interestingly, the con in contrast to what happened in social spending, in which social spending has been extremely dynamic the last 25 years, this is not true of infrastructure investment. Uh, and as a result, we have a huge infrastructure gap. Uh, there is actually an opportunity going forward uh, for Latin America. <clears throat> but in, you know, in contrast to that, you know, the opportunities uh, of international trade are much more moderate than they used to be. So this is a, 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 you know, a picture of the dynamics of the growth of world uh, trade in real terms. And we, we, we see here is two big booms in the post-world period, 1950 to 1974 and 1986 to 2007, and a huge reduction in the growth of international trade uh, since uh, the crisis. Uh, so you see, uh, when we open up to international trade, uh, international trade was growing 7% per year in real terms. Today, it grows just about 2%. And it's a huge difference, uh, and I'd come back to this because I think we have a st to stop thinking of international trade as the big opportunity for Latin America. Uh, we have to think uh, actually of more our own domain, uh, internal market as the big opportunity that we have uh, not focused on in the last 25 years. And the commodities continue to have high prices, um, you know, but they have started to fall. So the peak uh, was 2011. Uh, and since then, particularly non-oil commodities uh, have tended to uh, uh, to fall. Um, uh, uh, energy uh, uh, continues to be expensive, uh, but there is actually also the uh, prospect that it will weaken uh, in the future, basically because of the uh, changes uh, in the U.S. energy uh, balance. Uh, now, the, the big problem is that despite uh, the boom in international trade, uh, and, the, uh, and the booming commodity prices uh, that, fall, that continued after the crisis, uh, we have again uh, gone into spending our terms of trade bond. Uh, and this is, a big, this is the, big, uh, the biggest, I would say, 
uh, weakness uh, now in in, uh, in in Latin America. We we have a, a relatively high uh, uh, you know current account deficit despite uh, the uh, the high commodity prices that we still have. Um, and I would say uh, this uh, this is a, the biggest determinant of this. Uh, is uh, is uh, uh, the uh, exchange rate policies. So there is a, a bias, I would say, towards appreciation uh, in uh, in central bank policy that has not been corrected. Uh, and particularly, there is a lot of volatility in common, in, uh, in in the uh, in the real exchange rate uh, that does affect uh, significant investment in uh, in tradables. But the biggest uh, long-term trend is deindustrialization. This is according to the three series of uh, data from CEPAL, uh, the share of manufacturing GDP. Uh, we have consistently uh, re reduced uh, the share of uh, uh, manufacturing GDP, uh, and at the same time, uh, the increased dependence on commodities. So the red plus uh, yellow is the resource-based exports. Uh, they were falling in the 1980s and 1990s, but they have increased in the last 10 years, uh, again, uh, reversing uh, you know, historical trend in Latin America and in the world trade. Uh, and furthermore, the, the greatest opportunity that we have found, which is China, uh, is much more commodity dependent than the rest of our exports. Actually, we see that you know, uh, we essentially export more than 90% more than 90% of exports to China are commodities. Uh, this is also true of the rest of Asia, uh, uh, versus the U.S. and, uh, and, uh, and uh, intra-regional trade, uh, where the share of commodities is much lower uh, than uh, than in the exports to the European Union, and particularly to Asia. But even more importantly, uh, we have a huge, we have accumulated a huge technological lag. Uh, this is just uh, some data from a, a, a study by CEPAL uh, with three different indicators uh, in which we compare Latin America uh, with three uh, groups, uh, the mature economies, the emerging Asian economies, East Asia, uh, and the uh, natural resource-based developed countries. Uh, that is the, say, the Canadas and Australias and Norways of the world, let's say. Uh, and, we, uh, and then the, the, the first is uh, the share of engineering industries uh, in uh, manufacturing production, the second is uh, research and investment as a proportion of GDP, and the last is patents per million inhabitants. And what this shows is Latin America has accumulated a huge technological gap vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis any of the, of the groups, and in the last, we essentially don't exist. Uh, Latin America as a whole, you know, patents as much as Denmark. Okay, that's the tragedy. Uh, or the uh, of you know, 30 years of uh, not doing enough in research. So we do need a, a new economy for a new democracy. I mean, this this economy is, uh, in my in my view, incapable of responding to the uh, to the changes that we are seeing in the labor markets uh, and the changes that we are seeing in the uh, even in the push of civil society. So the the. Um, yeah, and the big pu the the big um, uh, the big push has to be uh, towards a more knowledge intensive uh, economies. And I call it knowledge because you can say technology is one of the elements of knowledge, but there are many uh, sectors in which is knowledge. Period. Uh, for example, health services, which is a, an area that Latin America has some uh, or, or some Latin American countries have have already. Uh, in, you know, rising uh, export uh, capacities, or the cultural industries, which is another c case in which we have a booming, uh, a, a booming economy in Latin America. So it's a knowledge-based uh, economy, which uh, we have created much and more opportunities uh, for uh, the sector. And this has to uh, be, in my view, a, a, a strategy that uh, puts, puts, puts reindustrialization at the center uh, of the strategy. Uh, but also, of course, uh, doesn't try to go away from the opportunities, uh, you know, created by uh, by commodities. Actually, one interesting uh, thing that you see here is that the natural resource-based developed countries uh, have a technology-intensive natural resource sectors, 
Uh, I mean, that's a big difference with Latin America. You see, in the, depending on the indicator, uh, it's a huge difference. For example, in engineering industries, it's three times uh, what we have. In research and development, as a proportion of GDP is five times. And in patents per million inhabitants, it's more than 100 times. So, so the, the big difference is, that, yes, natural resources, yeah, they generate an opportunity, but look at the technology opportunities and knowledge opportunities of that economy, right, than just on exploiting natural resources, which is the temptation of many of the countries. And there are also opportunities in the, as I said, in the knowledge intensive uh, services, uh, most notably for us, culture and health services, I think are good opportunities for uh, Latin America. We have to radically change our patterns of foreign trade, uh, uh, and uh, that includes our patterns of trade with China. Uh, the 19th century pattern of our trade with China, uh, which we export commodities and import manufacturers, uh, that is has to be has to change radically in the last uh, in the next uh, decade, you know, in the next decade or so. And, uh, uh, and lastly, and, uh, and very importantly, um, uh, we have to look at our own uh, domestic market as a much better opportunity than we have in the, in the last, uh, you know, 25 years. So there is a great opportunities. I mean, and given the weakness of international trade, I think the domestic market has acquired a great capacity to be an engine of growth for Latin America. Uh, but in particular, what I, I, I call the the, uh, the broader internal market, uh, which is that generated by a deep integration process, uh, which I think is a big opportunity for Latin America, an opportunity that we have consistently failed uh, to uh, live, you know, upon the promise. And so we uh, if actually I, I have no time, but let me say one of the most tragic things that has happened in the last ten years is the weakening of the integration processes in Latin America. So it's a big commitment to integration. I think it's a big opportunity uh, of actually using more the domestic market of all countries together uh, as an opportunity. The only country that does have a, 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 a large domestic market by itself is Brazil. Uh, and he uses it. Okay, Brazil, you use it here. But, but that is not an opportunity for the rest of Latin America. And, and actually, Brazil will also win quite a bit by integrating more deeply with Latin America. That's my own view. Uh, and I think the, the broader mar market is a huge opportunity uh, you know, uh, for, for you know, uh, growth in Latin America. Um, uh, and there are many things of you know, sh you know, combining the, uh, the strategy of innovation with that domestic market. For example, to multiply the uh, networks of educational innovation in Latin America. Which there are very few today. I mean, there are some, but, you know, very, they are extremely limited. Huge opportunities, you know, like the European Union has, uh, you know. And I think this is a big bet that we should go to. And lastly, but uh, very interestingly, also the infrastructure for integration, uh, on which there is a huge opportunity. It's also, uh, and it has to be an element of that uh, deep integration process. So domestic market. Uh, should be uh, the focus with all these elements and these opportunities that it brings. Okay, thank you very much.